Yes, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ingmar Riedel-Kruse. I'm a professor in bioengineering. And uh, so it's my distinct pleasure, first of all, to co-teach this course, but also to introduce today's speaker, uh, Stone Lebron, who is actually with us uh, in, uh, in a previous uh, instantiation of, of this course. So some of you may have seen him, but most of you don't. Um, Stone is a lead designer at Riot Games. He has uh, industry experience, game industry experience for more than 50 years. 15 years, he worked on a number, <laughs> on a number of uh, famous games, for example, SimCity or Diablo 3. Um, he also teaches game design in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon, for example, but also he gives game design seminars around the world, and he's also here today in that, that capacity. On a personal note, he loves uh, also board games and card games, and he has a huge collection of those at home, and he even designs those. And I guess it's always a good exercise to, to work with these old media if before or while going uh, into video games. Um, and today he will talk to us uh, on the topic of one-page design, which is a power, powerful method he co-developed and, and uses to organize uh, thoughts and to share and communicate uh, with your teammates, teammates on, on complicated projects. So welcome, Stone. So, um, so I'll just get right into it. The talk's about an hour, and we'll have a, maybe 10 minutes or so for questions at, at the end of it. So um, what I'll be talking about is first I'm going to talk about standard design documentation and kind of how things used to be done. Um, then I'll kind of describe, well, what is a one-page design anyway? What do we mean by that term? And then there'll be a big section about how to create your own. Because one of the things that I'd really like, especially for a class like this, is that you guys take this and then use this on your projects this semester um, as you turn in different assignments and as you work with your team on the design. Hopefully some of the things that I talk about will be really relevant to how you decide to structure your own projects. Um, and then I'll kind of wrap it up with why even bother doing this, uh, what are the benefits, but also some of the things that maybe might not work out so well and just kind of give you a heads up about some of the pitfalls that I've discovered over the years. Um, so first of all, I'll talk about design bibles. Is anybody familiar with this term? Okay, so not very many people. This used to be the, the thing um, back in the 90s uh, when the video game industry was really just starting to take off and the teams were getting bigger. They needed a way, of course, of trying to make sure everybody was working as a team, not just going off and doing their own things. So they would create these design bibles. And a design bible, in kind of its simplest form, is you would just go online, you would download a template, say like a, a Microsoft Word template that looks something like this, and you open that up as an outline mode in your, in your um, word processor, and you just start filling out all these paragraphs, one right after another. And the idea is, like this is just a small section of what one might look like, but the idea is that by the time I've typed in a paragraph or so on every one of these things, I've defined the, everything there is to know about the game. There's nothing left to write about. And so you would print these out. These are actually big, sometimes like hundreds of pages. And then you would give them usually to like the leads of the different groups, so like the art director, the executive producer, uh, the lead engineer, people like that would get these design bibles. And they're called bibles because as you can imagine, like this is the word of God from the designer. I'm coming down from the mountain and I'm like, here, do this. And my work is done, actually, at this point. As a designer, I can just go home because everything is in this document and just build it and everything will be cool. If you don't follow the plan, it's going to fall apart. So make sure you follow this to the letter. Um, so here's an early example of one of these that I did back in the 90s. This was actually for a very small flash game. I never got built. Um, but page one, just a whole bunch of text. And there's a few documents um, or a few uh, diagrams inside of this thing. But mostly, you know, this game is about creatures battling each other on kind of a soccer field. But everything is defined step by step. Every icon, every sprite, every sound effect. We just kind of work our way through and we're just very thorough in documentation about all the different systems and features that are going to be in the game as we kind of build up uh, what this game is going to be about and how players are going to interact with it. So, you know, we have things like every little sound effect. So when the whistle starts, we need a sound effect. And this is text describing what a sound should sound like. We have text describing what art should look like and so on. Uh, but the idea is that this is one person can do all of this. It might take a couple weeks, maybe a little longer, put all this together, but then you're ready to start the product and, and work on it. And this is actually a very standard way of doing design documents back in the 90s. This is from a game called Leisure Suit Larry. And is anybody familiar with this game? OK, just a few people. So it's kind of a cartoony game. It was like one of the first like R-rated uh, video games for PC. Um, and so the, the goal of the game is you're this lounge lizard named Larry, and you're trying to get 
one of many women into bed with you, and that's how you score points. Uh, probably wouldn't go over as well today as it did back in the 90s. Um, but here's like the very first page. It's just this huge table of contents uh, with like some 70 some pages in it where it just describes everything, um, every girl that you're going to meet and what will happen when you interact with them and so on. Um, this one, you might not be able to read this one, but this is the stuff you need to go on the dream date. And so this is just a tip for you guys if you're going on dream dates. Um, you'll need $5,000, three cigars, two condoms, one disinfectant, and 12 roses. So <laughs> gather that stuff together and the dream date is yours. Especially the disinfectant, I'm not sure where that came from. All right, so uh, another game, Grim Fandango. This was done by LucasArts. And this is another puzzle game uh, that was worked on by Tim Schafer. The, um, the setup, this is a document that I actually found online as a scanned PDF. So the other ones that I could find were all actually Word documents I could just download. This one's actually a PDF and scanned so you can see, like it still has the three ring binder holes punched in it. But it's every puzzle in the game all kind of mapped out. And this is page 72. So you get to the final end and there's this little box right here, which I'll zoom up for you. It says, to protect this document, please restrict your fallen tears of joy to this box. Thank you. And, and what I like about this, there's like a couple things going on here. Um, one is that Tim, who wrote this, he's pretty funny, he's a kind of comedian, and it's kind of a little funny joke, but what he's really saying is that I don't believe you actually got to the end of this. I wrote it, I spent a lot of time working on this, I'm surprised that you even got to the last page, because this was a lot of pages of text for somebody uh, to read through. And also you'll notice that this joke only works if it's printed. It doesn't really work if you're reading this on a computer monitor, because people don't you know, projectile cry <laughs> and, and ruin their monitors, right? It's like, it's paper, it's gonna be destroyed when you, when you cry down on it. Um, so he's kind of speaking both to the length of this thing, the fact that nobody reads them, um, and the fact that it's printed out, it's actually a physical document. All right, so pros of this approach are, this is where you go, this is everything. So what could be wrong with that? I, need a, I have a question I need answered, I pick up the design bible, it's in there someplace. And I know that it's all in that one place. I don't have to go hunting around for it. Um, every, you know, people, the leads should all have this on their desk. This is actually the most important part of this though, I feel, is you cannot make a design Bible if you don't know what you're talking about. You have to put a lot of thought into every sentence that you do. And when I used to write things like this, it was really, like I could spend an hour writing a paragraph maybe even longer, like a sentence could take a half an hour to write. And the reason why is because you have to be so precise, you have to really think it through, and you have to understand how it relates to every other sentence in this document. And that process of that very thorough uh, thinking through everything is the process of design, and the act of writing that all out is the, the act of design uh, for this game that you're working on. Of course, it doesn't scale up at all. As teams got bigger, um, as we started getting into the 2000s, teams were getting to hundreds of people and projects were getting bigger and bigger. Uh, definitely hard to manage updates, so let's say I make a change and I decide, you know, instead of 12 roses, you'll need 13 roses. So I type that into the document, but then what, I like reprint the entire 72 pages out again? And even if I do that, I just print one page and slip it in, how would you know that that change had been made? And so just the accountability of it and how that's set up is, is just really difficult. And it's also difficult to search, it's paper. So you could put a table of contents, you can put an index, you can do things like that. But ultimately you're trying to find one piece of information and you're looking through paper to find it, which is a pain. So to the rescue um, came the design wiki and we all know Wikipedia and wikis. So imagine an internal one of those that's just used for your game project. And this is gonna solve a lot of those cons with scaling. Um, and searching and things like that, obviously, because it's just on your desktop. But the concept is very similar. I start with a HTML page with a whole bunch of links, and I'm gonna just click on each link, I'm gonna start a new page, and I'm gonna type in the paragraph or so of information that's underneath that link as I define each one. And when I'm done clicking on every single link and making a page for every single one of them, then I'm design complete, and this is ready to go into production. I've answered every question possible about the, um, the game that we're gonna be working on. And so you can kind of see the, you know, it's just like this text, a wall of text that you click to get other walls of text at its kind of lowest form. But of course it's online, so you can decorate it up, you can put graphics, you can do a lot of other things. Uh, when I worked on Spore, this was the homepage for our wiki for the Spore game, 
And just a quick show of hands, who's played Spore or knows it? Okay, ah, wow, a lot of you, so okay. So if you've played it, one of the criticisms about the game is that it feels like five mini games. It doesn't feel like one entire game that's all put together. And when you look at this design of the wiki, it's kind of showing you what's going on. It's like, there's five different links. There was, we got rid of one of the games, but there's like different links that you can click on um, to go to different modules. And each team had their own wiki inside of this. So this looks nice and beautiful and like we're all organized and everything is cool. But really it's just complete chaos after this page because every team is doing whatever they want underneath their own link. And there was actually a very siloed um, design process, well, which is why the game kind of turned out like it was, like it did because there were a lot of teams not talking to each other. And the wiki actually somewhat helped enforce that because you would just click on your module and you would go into it and just do all your work there. <coughs> This, uh, by contrast, this is a game I worked on uh, at EA called The Simpsons Video Game. And this one, we had a dedicated producer whose job it was, was to manage the wiki. So it was like a Nazi of the wiki, like everything had to go through him and he made sure that everybody followed the exact same format all the time. And so we have this kind of mind map here. My particular job was right here. I was in charge of the Springfield hub. So you get a sense of scale of like how big the project was where one designer can just work on that little bit there as a full-time job. And everything had to go through this format. It looks something like this. Um, you'd have a page, you would write your pages out, and then you'd actually have to have a meeting where you would go in and you would read your page out loud to everybody in the room. And everybody would have to agree that it was cool and then they would mark it as finished or go back and rework it. And then you would have another meeting where you'd have to read it until it eventually got to the point where everybody, all the leads on the team could agree that this is what we were going to do. Um, so, you know, very thorough process, very robust, but it has this little thing about we can't trust anybody to actually read it unless we call a meeting and then I read it to them out loud word by word. That's the only way we can guarantee that people actually read stuff these days. Um, so, um, so it works, but it's, it's cumbersome and it's maybe a little more effort than you might want on a team if you're trying to be efficient. Um, we also kind of made this mistake early on, we thought it was cute that we would make the background yellow um, because the Simpsons are yellow and then our eyes were bleeding by the time the, uh, the project was done. All right, so pros of that approach, of course, easy access, it's on your desktop, you just click a link in your browser, you're looking at the design document. Super easy to update, just double click and just make your edit. It's all in little chunks, like you saw in the mind map. Everybody can work in their own, own little bit, which means the whole team is contributing. It's not one designer up in the ivory tower giving you know, the Ten Commandments down to everybody else. Everybody on the team is all working together, and it's very collaborative that way, which is great for morale and you know, gets a lot of the good ideas out. But also, since it's a wiki, we know when anybody makes any edit. We know who made that edit, and we know down to the second when that edit was made, and we can diff and even see what they changed. So if you, people are just going in and making changes, and you read it, and you're like, where would that come from? You know who to go talk to, and when they made those changes, and, and have a discussion about that. So that's all great, and it solves almost you know, most of the problems from the design bible, the printed out version that I talked about. But the cons, as I just, just uh, discussed, it requires constant maintenance. You need that person on the team whose job it is, is to make sure that everybody follows the rules and reads all the stuff. It hides design relationships, which I'll talk more about in a bit. But basically when, you're, when everything's in these little modules, it's hard to really understand how all those modules connect to each other in a holistic way. Uh, it's low resolution, meaning that most of the time you're looking at it on your screen. And you know, screens have pretty good resolution, but you're really like kind of stuck. Like this is a gigantic screen, but you'll see a lot of examples of this. Like when I look, I see all the pixels. Um, it's just the bigger the screens get, the more the fatter the pixels start to become. Um, and you know, monitors are getting better and better all the time, but compared to printers, like a printer now you know, is thousands of dots per inch um, compared to monitors. And uh, the most frustrating thing for me as a designer though is that it forces all your designs to fit into this aspect ratio of a monitor. So you'll see examples of this in a moment. What if my design happens to want to be another format that it, it wants to go um, up and down instead of landscape, then I'm gonna have to ask, ask the person reading it to scroll or zoom in and zoom out. And you know, sure, we can fit it all on the screen, but that means everything gets smaller or we can zoom up on it. And I like to think of it, if you've gone scuba diving or snorkeling, when you put the mask on and it's really clear where you're looking, but everything else just gets blocked out. And why should people have to look at my designs just section by section if they could look at the whole thing all at once? So mostly it gets down to this where um, 
people just don't read anymore. It's really difficult to get people to read stuff. And if I, I mean, there's actually eye tracking studies that show this. You give people, say, I'll send you a link in an email. It's like, hey, check this out. And you click on it. And one of the first things that people do is they read the headline, they look at all the pictures, and then they immediately look over at the thumb bar on the side and they gauge how big the thumb is compared to how much scrolling they're going to have to do. It's one of the very first things they do. And if it's a, a small thumb bar and a long thing, it's like, uh, yeah, maybe I'll very quickly scroll up and down. Um, if it's a really fat thumb bar, it's like, I might actually read this. But in a lot of cases, you're going to bookmark it, which what does that mean? It means you'll never read it again. It'll just go into the pile of bookmarks that you'll never read. And then it's lost. Now, that's all fine if it's just some funny little link to some cute little video or whatever, or some, some you know, like web page. Uh, but it's not fine if your job is to create documentation that nobody's reading and that your team isn't reading it and that's what they're getting paid for. So this is like a big problem. And my solution to this is really, it's like, well, what if I only have one page and it's printed? There's one page and this is the design. Now there's nothing to turn to, there's nothing to scroll to, there's nothing to zoom in and out on. It's all just right there. Nobody has any excuses to say that they didn't see everything because it was all right there. There was no page two to look at. All right, so before I get into how to make your own, let me just first kind of describe my inspirations for these. Um, so when I was younger, I wanted to be an architect and did a lot of drafting classes and, and things like that. Um, this is um, an example, just a kind of a random floor plan. And if I were to draw this, this is a one-page design. It fits on one page, has all the information that you could use to, to build this floor of this house, or certain parts of it anyway. And if I were to ask you, would you like to live in this house? It's kind of like, do I? Like, I don't know if I want to live in that thing or not. It's really kind of hard to interpret whether you would really enjoy living in it. Um, so I might instead give you some kind of illustration of where it would be and say, oh, you want to live here? It's like, oh, that's beautiful. That's a nice elevation big trees, friendly people, like, yeah, I would want to live there. Um, but now imagine the opposite where I go to a contractor and I say, hey, can you build this for me? Like, they would look at you and be like, what? Like, I can't build that for you just from that picture. They're going to want this. And what I'm really getting at here is when I say, and you know, this talk is one page designs with an S, it's not that you want to make one page that describes everything about your video game for everybody and you do one page and then you're done. It's, you're going to be making a lot of these, and each one is going to be focused on a very particular audience with a very particular theme. And so if I'm going for, say, a contractor, I'm going to want completely different information than if I'm going for somebody like a marketing person or something like that who just wants to see the outer shell. All right, so here's another one-page design. Um, I'm guessing most of you have played with Legos and have seen things like this all through your life. Um, so this is great. Like, look. Like, how could you not just read this instantly? It's like, it's so clear, there's so much information here, um, and yet the presentation, it's almost like you can't make a mistake building this little jet boat. Um, this one here, another one page illustration showing a single engine airplane uh, engine. And this is what I was talking about, design relationships, where you can imagine the mind map, the Simpsons thing that I showed you, where it's just a bunch of text and boxes, and we're like, engine as a word in the middle, and then all these lines going out with each one of these descriptors on it, and then you have to click on these to then go to a page that describes just that one piece. You lose the relationship between all the pieces. And so this is kind of showing like, hey, we can put it all together, we can give you a lot of information, and we can show you very high quality the relationships between these parts and how they might interact. Uh, this is a children's placemat. So who had these when they were kids? Okay, yeah, a lot of you do. So you, basically your parents buy these to protect the furniture, the table that you're going to be eating on because when you're a kid you're making a big mess. They don't quite work, I think. If they're really successful in illustration, the kid wants to look at the illustration so they push all their food off of the illustration <laughs> so they can look at it. So that's kind of a mismatch. Um, but still, they're, that's a really cool one-page design. Like, there's, look at how much information about dinosaurs they've kind of packed onto this. You have like relative scales. You have the, uh, the timeline about what age, what period they were in. Um, kind of their names, how big they are, things like that, all on this one page showing all these relationships in a way that has like not really that many words but a lot of information uh, content. Who knows this diagram? Okay, just a couple of you. So for those who don't know it, when you first look at it, you're like, so? Like it's kind of this weird abstract thing. Um, but about 30 seconds from now, you'll actually have an emotional reaction to this. So what it is, it's Napoleon's march from Poland into Moscow and back. 
And the thickness of this is the troop strength. And so he started down here and went up to Moscow, turned around, and came back. And this is the troop strength when he returned. Um, like I said, so once you know how to read this, it's actually incredibly powerful. Like it makes a, a, an amazing story. What I really like about it is how many levels of information are contained in this diagram. So um, in addition to you know, the troop strength that I talked about, you, this is actually on a map. So you can see like where they cross rivers and you can see how different troops split up. So like in this case, this troop splits up and goes attacks another objective and then they rejoin the army here so you can see they're kind of thin and then they rejoin so they get spatter right here. But it was winter when they were coming back. This is showing the temperature on their way back as it gets colder and colder. And so these rivers were covered in ice and you can see as they cross the river, they lose like more than half their troops crossing these icy rivers as the ice breaks and they don't make it across. So you get these little stories about uh, temperature, place, troop movements. All of this is all just in this relatively simple uh, one page illustration. Uh, this is Edward Tufte, and if you're interested in this subject at all, then you should look up his books. I'm sure they're in your libraries, and I wouldn't recommend running out and just getting them on Amazon because they're, I think they're like $60 each. But um, I'm not, and the library has to have them here, so you might want to try to check them out or just read through them. It's, he's kind of the patron saint of, of information design, and the books are just filled with just excellent examples of what you should do and also things that you shouldn't do. Like they have a lot of examples of USA Today charts, which is like, don't do this. Um, but uh, great information there. And most of the stuff you see is um, lessons. Uh, the way that I lay these things out and talk about them is coming straight from Tufty's ideas. All right, so let me get into some real world examples of these that I've made over the years. This was, it's not, I didn't really consider this a one page design when I made it. This is actually very standard in UI. And this is like a wireframe diagram showing how the user is going to move through the flow of a bunch of dialog boxes and screens. So this was, I was working at Blizzard and this was for um, Diablo 3. And just kind of showing, you know, we're gonna, this will be an opening screen and I can like pick different characters to create and I can change my password and get new passwords and read the terms of service and all of this stuff. So it all has to be documented out. And, you know, like I mentioned, sometimes the design just wants to be more of a portrait format or legal page or something, and it just doesn't fit. So here I have this example of I'm on this gigantic monitor up here on stage, and I, if I were to squeeze this thing down to fit on this monitor, it'd be almost impossible to read because it's just going to scrunch all the text. In fact, like, even I'm really close to this, and I can't read some of these words at all um, because of just the distortion that's caused by the pixels on this. Um, but like I said, this is fairly standard, so there's nothing super unique about this, this diagram. Uh, but what was interesting about it for me in my career as a game designer is I had made this diagram. We had actually done all this work, and this one was kind of out of date for where we were in the project. But I had done a lot of the other text-type uh, documents, like the design bibles. And I'd printed them out, and I went into our lead engineer, uh, Jason, and said, hey, no, let's talk about that document that I wrote that I gave you. And he's like, um, I don't know, it's somewhere on my desk. And there's a big stack of papers on his desk and books. And he's like looking around for it and he can't find it. And he obviously hadn't read it yet. And so I'm like, hey, I notice on the wall you have this hanging up on your wall. And we've already finished this project, but this is hanging up. And the thing that's important is you don't even know where it is and you haven't even read it yet. Why is that? He's like, because that looks cool. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, it looked cool. So I hung it up. And I was like, oh, hmm, that's interesting. So at, that, that was kind of the moment that started me of like, what if I could make all my stuff look cool that people would want to hang up? Then maybe that would be the best way of getting design information across to the team. So I decided to try it with um, taking basically the big text thing that I had written and changing it into um, a, one piece of paper, like a poster. Uh, this is actually another one that's really long that scrolls off the screen. But we were working on, if you play Diablo, Diablo 2 was all sprite based and with 2D graphics, and Diablo 3 was gonna be 3D, so we had to build all the engines and pipelines and everything from scratch. And this was just a test to make sure that our engine and pipelines were working. We called it D-Hack. A very simple little town, you make a character, and you just go down through these levels, and the levels are gonna like, have different things happening in them, and I forget how many levels there were, uh, but this page like, scrolled down some more. So very kind of simple, and sure enough, people were hanging it up on their walls while we were working on this D-Hack. Um, after we got through this and we started moving on, I'm like, this is pretty good. Like, this is working. People like this format. So let me use it for the real game. 
So this is Act 1 of Diablo 3, a very early version of it, where you can see I'm just taking like very simple iconography to kind of show waypoints and caves and trees and things like that. And the player is going to start over here at the dock and they're going to work their way through castles and go down into dungeons. And you notice this was obviously printed out. It was taken to a meeting and we would write on it. We would say, this is a problem. We have to change this. We want to fix that. And then I would take it back to my desk. I would iterate on it. I'd fix all the mistakes, add all the extra content that we wanted, and then take it into another meeting and repeat and repeat and repeat. And the next slide that you're going to see, I think, is almost a year later. So you'll see the difference between if you just take one little change and you do that every week or so for a year, this is the, one of the final uh, diagrams for Act 1 um, as it starts to get more and more content added to it. Now, I know you can't read all the stuff because of the problems that I've talked about earlier, um, but I'm going to zoom in a little bit to one area. And this is kind of what I call the score for Diablo 3. And it was a way of mapping out how the player's experience is going to work through the, the game as they play it. So up here, what you see is like, this is level 13. The player's going to be playing it for about 20 minutes. They have already played the game for an hour and a half. So when they finish this level, it should be about an hour and 50 minutes of play time into the game so far. And while they're in this area, here's the six monsters they're going to be fighting. And each monster has a little AI note. And maybe they're lightning, or maybe they're poison, things like that. And so it specs out the whole level. This next one here is only 10 minutes long, so we don't need as much content for a 10-minute level as we do for a 20-minute level. But all the content's figured out in advance to hit these timing beats that we want the player to hit. Um, it's a big mistake, yet I see it happen all the time, of people build their game and then they see how long it will take to play. And you should really figure out how long you want the player to play first and then fill the content to match that. Otherwise, you're just making a lot of assets that you don't even really know how they're going to be used and how much time they're going to be on. Um, so basically, we can kind of break it all down. That's why I call it a score in the way that, um, like if you're an, at an orchestra and you're a conductor, the conductor has like the big score that shows all the different pieces. Each player might only have their own part, but the conductor needs to see the whole thing and keep everybody together. So this would be that equivalent uh, for the designer. This is another little module um, from the game. This actually got cut, but it was a kind of uh, Dota League of Legends style thing that we wanted to put into Diablo 3. It ended up getting cut because they didn't think like we had time to build it all up. But if you kind of look at it, you were building these bases, and then your base and an enemy base would be hooked together, and minions would go down the lanes, and you'd be fighting with your Diablo character as a single character that could level up really fast and then fight all the minions. And then you would basically break into their house and then destroy their stuff, and you would win. Uh, so if you played League of Legends, like you, you know how that works. Um, sadly, this got cut before League of Legends even was created. And so we were always like, you know, maybe we shouldn't have cut this. this might, there might have been something here. Um, but the, the real point here is notice how I just explained to you something very complicated in about less than 30 seconds. I was able to do it because I had this drawing up here behind me. And I know that you're thinking the same things that I want you to think because I know what you're looking at as I talk. And this is like very, very powerful. If I were to write all the stuff that I just said down and then give you a piece of paper and say, hey, read this so you can understand all about this module that I got cut, everybody would have a different thing in their mind. And I wouldn't even know what that was. So this is a really powerful way of like, if you bring these into meetings and show them to the teammates, you know they're thinking the same thing that you are thinking while, they're, while you're showing them to them. All right, so here's a concept artist view of Diablo 2. And who's played Diablo 2? OK, quite a few of you. Does this ever happen anywhere in the game? No. But is this what you believe happened when you go to bed at night and you have dreams about Diablo II or you these memories? It's like, yeah, I remember doing that. It's like, no, that never happened. Um, but you feel that. And so this is like kind of the concept artist's interpretation of Diablo. And it's, really, it's pretty cool. Uh, sadly, this is the game designer's version of Diablo. It looks like this. Um, it's just a bunch of mouse clicks in a 2D space. And so as part of Diablo 3, we were trying to figure out the skill system. And we went through Diablo 2, and every single skill, we broke it down into these kind of atoms into like, how do you click? And a lot of people will criticize Diablo as like what they call a click fest, meaning you're just clicking your mouse all the time. But it's not really true. You're clicking your mouse differently over time. Sometimes you click slow. Sometimes you click fast. You go back to town. You get a rest for a while. Sometimes you click and hold. Sometimes you drag. What's every possible thing you can do with a mouse on a 2D surface 
it's a skill somehow in Diablo 2. They did a really good job of kind of breaking it up so that it's not just click once every second for three hours. It's actually like a, when you really map it out, it's this really cool rhythm of how you like a lot and then a little and then a rest and then a lot and these activities, highs and lows. So this page right here as a one page design was like, here's the atoms of a skill. These are all the very simple primitives. And then we would make a separate page for every skill in Diablo 3 where using this as, if you think of these as words, we're building up paragraphs over here that will eventually tell stories in the game. And so once you've defined the first page, it makes it really easy to start like cranking out a bunch of these uh, detailed skills uh, one by one, showing how they all go. And just uh, real quickly, I won't go into these, but basically O is the player and X is a monster. So we call them the football plays. So it's like how you're running your play through, through the level and what you're encountering along the way. All right, completely switching gears now. Uh, the other project that I worked on um, with the Simpsons game, my job was to make Springfield in 3D and or design it all out. So I had the fortunate job of every single Simpsons episode ever created was a link on my desktop that I could just click and watch anyone. And I had to go through and by looking and watching all the TV shows, figure out how Springfield would look. And so I was like, that's a pretty cool job, like watching Simpsons all day and getting paid for it. Um, but this was the best I could find in the TV show of what Springfield looks like. This was on the police chief's um, desk. And it's like, okay, there's a river and a lake, I think, somehow in Springfield. And that's ba basically all I knew, and some zones. So the other approach was we went to Gracie Studios, the animators who make The Simpsons, and we said, could you send us a whole bunch of your background art? and we'll piece it together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. We'll take all your background art from all these different shows and we'll figure out how it all goes together to make your town. And they sent us a bunch of stuff and we started looking at it and realized it's like, well, this is impossible because, well, for one thing, who knows what this is? The nuclear power plant. Every single background they sent us had the nuclear power plant in the background. <laughs> And it's kind, of like, it's kind of like when you're a kid and you draw a picture, you always draw the sun as a circle with all these lines. It's in, like in every picture, you stick it up in the corner. This is their way of when you look at it, it could be any town until you draw that in the background and now it's Springfield because Springfield has a nuclear power plant in it and so now you know. Um, and also things that were just kind of interesting were like this King Toots music store. It's not, in, it's not always next to Moe's. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But the first time it's next to Moe's is because there was a joke in the show which was that Lisa needs a reed for her saxophone and the concert's gonna be at whatever, seven o'clock. And if Homer doesn't get her the brand new reed, she's gonna fail, it's gonna sound terrible. So Homer's like, don't worry daughter, I would never let my daughter down, I'm gonna go get that reed for you, I'll be there. So he races, gets in traffic accidents or whatever, finally gets there, pulls up, looks at his watch, and he's like, oh, they don't close for five more minutes, I have time for a beer. And then he goes into Moe's. Um, so then of course he doesn't get the reed, but that joke works because the music store just happens to be next to the tavern. The joke would not work if you know, the tavern were on the other side of town. And so the, we realized it's like, there is no one Springfield. Springfield becomes what it needs to become because of the jokes. And at first that was kind of frustrating to us. We're like, we're never gonna be able to build this up. But then we realized, no, that means we can build it however we want as long as our jokes and as long as our gameplay is the strongest. So that was kind of liberating. So we went through this process of kind of what does the town look like. And our first pass of just a bunch of cardboard boxes and yellow stickies that we would just stick down. Now, what you're looking at here is a one page design. It's one piece of paper. It's a very big piece of paper, a um, bunch of cardboard boxes on a table, but it fits all of the requirements that I've been talking about for what a one page design should be, which is like, there's nothing to turn to. It's all out in the open. Everybody can see it. This was in the middle of the design area that we had and you couldn't walk through the team area without seeing this. Everybody was aware of it, whether you were an artist, a producer, marketing, engineer, whatever. They were all aware of what design was working on and could contribute and they could see it growing as we worked on it more and more. So having it like this compared to we were all working on little files on our own desktop, uh, just a huge advantage for the team, especially early in uh, pre-production. Uh, eventually we kind of like started getting it more figured out. Notice there's still a river running through the middle of it because that's the one thing we were able to keep uh, from that police chief's map. This is kind of the final diagram kind of showing how the suburbs are over here and diff four different quadrants, each with kind of a different art style and different um, architecture that would be there to keep the player kind of knowing where they're at. And as you kind of move through, 
Um, the sense that it's an open world, so you feel like it goes forever, but notice you get on the highway and it just goes round in circles, and there's no way really out of this town. Um, eventually, I kind of missed the map that we had, so I reprinted out on a big piece of plotter paper, started cutting out these buildings out of foam core that were actually to scale, because we wanted to get a sense of the vertical sight lines, because you need those so the player doesn't get lost. They can look and they can just identify things in the distance. Uh, so we wanted to get a sense of how that would all work. Um, it's kind of a zoom in of, of one little area, the industrial area. Uh, this was one diagram that's showing a boss battle. And I won't really go through it, but basically Lard Lad comes to life, and this is his um, movement through the town as he destroys everything and you have to try to battle him. Uh, but we can use the same map with a different overlay to show different information, different designs. So in this case, there was a mini game that Homer had to collect 100 bottles of beer and put them in his garage on shelves. Um, so he would go around town trying to find bottles of beer. And what this really is showing is there's kind of two dimensions to this, um, actually three. One is the space that the beer is located in. One is what phase of the game, early, mid, or late game, that you're going to be finding it in. And one is how difficult it is to get once you find it. So some of you might just walk up, if they're a green circle, just pick it up off the street. The red ones, you'd have to do some kind of maneuver or some kind of puzzle uh, to be able to get to it. But notice a diagram like this kind of very quickly shows us that um, as a team, we're taking maximum advantage of the 3D terrain that we're making. We're putting stuff not just through space, but through time and through difficulty level as well, and mapping out those axes on one piece of paper. This is the final kind of view of Springfield. Um, you look at it, it looks a lot different. You think at first, here's the Simpsons house right here. Here's that highway that I talked about, the river still running through it. So we changed the angles a bit just to make it more organic, to make it feel more like a real city. Um, but it really is basically this. So once you come up with something like this as your foundation, you're pretty confident that as you build on top of it, everything's going to hold together. So you don't want to do a lot of detail early on. Like for instance here, every sidewalk, the width of the sidewalk is actually important for uh, pathing algorithms and things like that. Um, also I had to do every single interior and make a one-page design diagram for each one of those. So what can be destroyed, what can be picked up, what triggers little video scenes, all of that has to be notated in there. And every asset, everything that we think we're going to need to make the scene believable to somebody who's watched The Simpsons TV show has to be marked. And it's going to have to be made at some point. So you're going to have to get people um, trying to like build all these 3D models and texture them and, and put sound effects on them and get them in your game. So it's got to be marked down somewhere. Um, eventually, I made this gigantic poster of every single interior with a call out to where it was on the map. And this didn't necessarily need to be done, but I was just trying to like, use as much paper as I could to make the biggest one-page design diagram I could possibly make. Um, and this, you know, this is really the trick. It's like, hey, you can make any design fit on one page. Just you, know, you need a really big page. <laughs> All right, so creating your own. Um, the, um, uh, Basically, I'm showing you a lot of like, really nice, pretty stuff, but most of it starts out like this. The uh, Spore game, we were working on an expansion pack, and actually they were asking for pitches from the team about what the expansion pack should be like. And one of the ideas was that you could build your own planets and your own adventures and your own little uh, you, uh, drama that could go on. Um, so instead of just following the rules of the normal game, you could actually make your own games inside of Spore. And what we did was we just got a piece of paper and scissors and markers, and we brought teammates in one at a time, and we sat them down and said, pretend you're playing this game. What would you like to do? And they would say, like, well, I want to make a character called Joe. And so we'd get out a piece of paper and a marker, and we'd draw Joe and put him down. And it's like, well, what does Joe do? Well, Joe's able to like, do this and that, and he needs to pick up a key. OK, well, let's make you a key. And then he's going to meet Amy. All right, well, let's make, Amy. Let's, uh, make a little Amy card. And then he talks when Amy comes up to him. So OK, let's make a dialogue box. And we basically paper prototyped out the experience that the player would go through by within a day or two, most of the team had gone through. And as more people came through, we had more parts to pull from, and we started to refine our ideas. So very quick, doesn't need a programmer, obviously doesn't need an artist. And you can get a huge amount of information in a very fast amount of time with this approach. So as you guys get further in the semester and you start to get ideas about what your game is, I really recommend you spend at least one lunch, like an hour, trying to play a game like this on paper and you'll learn, trust me, you'll learn a lot from that experience. Um, all right, so this was my kind of redoing to make it nicer. And this is what I showed to the executives and said, this is what we would like to make as an expansion pack for Spore. And it actually got accepted as this is a cool idea. 
uh, once I explained it to them. And this was all I had, was this one piece of paper. Um, it was built up on the stuff I just showed you so that I knew kind of what I was talking about. Um, but this was enough to get the project a green light. Now, like I talked about, this is the, uh, this is the, the house, the elevation view of the house. Like, would you want us to build this? Yeah, that looks cool. But if I give this to developers and say, build this, there's just like, what? How do I, like, you're just giving me this piece of paper and I'm supposed to build this. I don't understand it. So diagrams like this are what the team is going to see that I would then start creating to kind of show all the different modules and their relationships with each other and how they're going to build out. Now, notice this one is not exciting to look at. It doesn't have a lot of pretty graphics and cute dinosaurs and things like that. Um, and if I were to show this to the marketing people and say, hey, want to build this product? They would look at me and be like, no, we don't want to build that. No one would ever play this game. It's really boring. Um, but the developers need this. We need to understand the scope of the project and all the different features. Um, in that game, it's called Galactic Adventures. You could build your own planets and make your own little scenarios on them. And so we wanted to ship with a whole bunch of these scenarios ready to go so that the player could see how we would do it in the studio. And our rule was that we had to use the same tools as the end user to build these. So we mapped out the original plan was 64 of these things. Um, the different acts and different scenes and all the stuff that we would need. And then level designers would take these plans and then try to build them. Um, this is kind of the list. And this was hanging up on the wall. Each of these is just an eight and a half by 11. But we had a big wall that we hung them all up on. So it's kind of like one giant one page diagram where you can see the scope of what we're really trying to build. And everybody's able to see it. But if you make a mistake and you have to change something, you just go up and you pull down the, the page that's wrong and you put a new page up. You don't have to like, keep wasting huge amounts of ink and paper to reprint the whole thing just because of one tiny little change. So this is like a really efficient way of kind of module, uh, making modules out of your design and then keeping track of the scope of the whole project. All right, so if you want to make your own um, one of these, here's a template that I recommend. Um, these slides actually will make them available. We'll get a link out to the class. Um, so you can download the slides so you don't need to redraw this. But um, what you should really do is you open up your um, program, hopefully Adobe Illustrator, I'll talk about in a second. And the first thing you do is you type the title. Don't do anything else until you've typed the title onto the document somewhere. And the reason why is you kind of want to know what you're doing before you start doing it. And if you can't even figure out what the title of the document is, then you're already in a bad place. You shouldn't be like doing a lot of detail work. So really figure that out. Figure out the audience. Who's going to want to see this? Why are they going to want to see it? And what's it called? So they know whether to, when they see that title, whether they should pay attention or not. The next thing is to put the date on it, because you're going to be printing these things out. And unlike a normal computer file that has a date stamp on it, you are going to print these out, and they're going to lose that date information really quick. And what happens, you think it's like, oh, I'll remember the most up-to-date one, but you don't. And people will hold up a document and say, I'm doing what you told me to do. And you're like, uh, wait, that's the out-of-date document. And the date's going to keep track of that. So I have a discipline that I use every time I open a file to make an edit. The very first thing I do is I change the date to today's date, and then I save it instantly. And then I start working. Because um, if you kind of mess around with the date, you're going to regret it later on, like if you don't pay attention and keep it up to date. Um, as far as the actual document goes, lots of white space is key. Yes, you could take one piece of paper and cram it full of text. No one will ever read it. Um, you need to let it breathe. You need to get the ideas kind of out in a way that it's attractive, it's appealing, that people want to look at it, they want to engage in it. And one thing that um, will destroy that is putting everything really close together. Uh, usually I put a big main illustration, something that just kind of is the focus of what's going on as an illustration, not as text. And then as you need details, just do little call outs, um, inserts, little notes here and there, uh, maybe a big description down on the bottom, like what is this thing that you're looking at. And then lots of bullet points. And people will read bullet points much more readily than they'll read a paragraph, even though you're just taking the paragraph and you're turning it into a bunch of bullet points. Um, it's just a big difference to people to try to parse it and understand what they're looking at step by step. Um, so ad use Adobe Illustrator. Who in here uses Adobe Illustrator? Good. So you guys are all set. Um, if you want to try to do this in Photoshop, don't. Find somebody who knows how to use Adobe Illustrator. You can do it in Photoshop, but it's just a big pain. You want the vectors, because when you print them out, you want the highest quality possible. And when you print Photoshop out really big, it's just big, fuzzy pixels. Plus, the file sizes are huge, where these are actually really compact um, and easy to change. You're going to be moving stuff around, rotating stuff, 
resizing stuff constantly as you work on something like this. So you want a program that's good at working with vectors instead of pixels. All right. Um, actually, with time, the when, so when should we be done for questions? Okay. All right. So this is the um, another diagram as an example of what I just talked about. So here, this was an unshipped game idea um, based on Spore, where you'd build. If you played Nintendo Dogs or games like that, the idea was to make a Spore creature and then you could play with it as your pet, and that would just be kind of a standalone game. Um, notice. Don't worry too much about the details, but notice the big drawing in the middle, the main drawing, the title, creature traits, the, um, as we kind of like call outs as we go around. There's no illustrations on here. There's nothing really fancy going on, but it's still, it's approachable. And there's just this little bit of spot color to kind of bring it to life, but also show off these main ideas and kind of talk about this color wheel idea, how colors mix together. Uh, to form new colors. In this game, you could train your pet different way and then take different skills and form them together. So for instance, if you're very physical and you're very playful, you might become a dancer. If you're physical and creative, you might become a sculptor. And if you're creative and playful, you might become a musician. So it's kind of just showing that in a very simple way. We don't have pictures of saxophones and ballet dancers and athletes. Like that's just a distraction. Um, but it's very common when I see people make these. They want to put a picture in for every idea. Uh, just because, I don't know, but you want to really like trim out you know, and make the important information important and not just distract people with random pictures of ballet dancers and football players. Um, if you're going to make one of these charts or make one of these one page designs for your projects, I really recommend trying a flow chart first because I think they're the easiest to do and conceptualize what you're doing. Make a main loop for your game. Figure out what the player is doing and how that repeats over and over again as they play through the game. What's the core of the game and how does the player interact? So this is from that creature game. Um, the creature chooses something to do. Let's say the creature decides to uh, chew up the furniture. Then the player chooses how to respond to the creature. So they could say, oh, that was really great. I love it when you chew up the furniture. Here's a treat. Or I'm going to discourage you from doing that and say, don't chew up the furniture anymore. That kind of gets updated into his training history, how you're telling him. And he, the creature tends to want to do things that you treat him, and the things that you tell him not to do start to get dampened down in the odds tables over time. Um, meanwhile, the creature is kind of looking at his environment, like, is there furniture to chew on? He's looking at his needs and moods. Am I hungry? And then he's looking at the commands that the player is giving him, like the player may say, fetch this stick. And he takes all of this together and chooses his next action, and it runs through the loop. Again, don't worry about the details of this particular game that I'm talking about. What I want you to focus on is how easy it is to see the flow of this game that you've never played because of this diagram. It makes it really clear the interactions between the in-game characters and the player and how those relationships work. For SimCity, we had a, a similar one. This is super simple flowchart. It's saying there's buildings, there's people, and there's places that they want to go. And the, the source building, the house, creates these agents who look for a sink to meet their need. So this building might create um, a mother who needs to go get burgers for, to feed her family. So she looks for restaurants as a sink. And she carries information, maybe money, with her as she goes from source to sink. Very simple diagram, but super important for the SimCity project. Because we really wanted everybody on the team, and it's a team of about 100 people, if they didn't understand these three words, they would just be lost because our whole system was built on these three words and how those interactions between a sink, an agent, and a source, how, how they work together. So I made this. I stuck it up on the wall. Everybody got it right away because it's simple. But if I hadn't put this up on the wall to make it really clear to everybody, there might have been miscommunications later on. Now, the great thing, though, is once you get this, you can make flow charts like this. Because as soon as people understand the basic concepts, you can then build on top of them and make increasingly more complicated diagrams where people can understand because they've seen the preliminary ones first. So this is just kind of a similar idea where a house makes a person. If the person's sick, they're going to like look around for um, a hospital. If they're healthy, they're going to look in their wallet. And they're like, do I have money? If I have money, I'm going to spend it. If I don't have money, I need to get a job. And so, and that which will give me money. And so the Sims are kind of like just looking up every morning. Either I'm going to I'm going to make money or spend money every day. And this flowchart kind of shows how the city was working um, on that scale um, as you start to see the pieces flow through it. Another thing you can do is a storyboard. 
So this is unlike a typical like video or movie storyboard. This is showing you the main beats of the game, the main modules that the player is going to be going through and how long they're going to be spending on each one. So it's not meant to be the cinematic experience. It's meant to be, in this case, it could be hours and hours of gameplay time and how it's going to be all set up. So here you kind of pick which creature you want to hatch. The um, egg hatches. This is like less than a minute. And then for the next five, 10 minutes, you're going to get this little baby grows up. You name him. Um, you start care and feeding. And then they quickly kind of become a kid. And for the next uh, several hours, you are training them. And you're teaching them to do little tricks and things like that. Then they turn into an adult. And they can actually like train other creatures and raise their own little pets. Um, so this is just kind of showing this flow. But again, this part here of like, why would I waste a lot of time on this on the art and animation and sound effects of this egg hatching phase if the player only sees it for a minute. Where this part of the game over here, where the player is playing three hours or more, we really want to make sure that we hit that and we mo put most of our effort, our production effort, into that. This is another kind of flowchart, or another storyboard for SimCity. This one is really hard to storyboard. My producer's like, where's the storyboard? I need to see how this game plays out. And I told him it was impossible to do. Because SimCity, if you played it, there's no story to it. You can do whatever you want in any order that you want. Um, but he didn't like that answer. And I had a bunch of documents of text where he didn't want to read them. He's like, I just want the picture. Just show me the picture. There's actually a problem with working with this approach is that your producers like, expect everything to be done this way. Um, but eventually, I came up with a, a, an approach where it's like, you can do whatever you want in SimCity, but this is the worst possible thing you can do. You can build garbage dumps and slums and then um, burn coal power plants and just steal money from people. Um, and we called that uh, Bur uh, Pittsburgh. And, <laughs> and this one over here, the best thing you could possibly do, uh, build solar power, wind power, and parks, and schools, and universities, and hospitals, and, and rich people love to live here. And we call this one Berkeley. Um, and we got in trouble later on because I said that in an interview. And some people from Pittsburgh got really mad at me. They're like, Pittsburgh's beautiful. And Berkeley sucks. You've been to Berkeley? Like, it's like not really a joyous place to be. Um, this is another little um, kind of storyboard showing a particular event through the city, how it flows. So these people get up in the morning. They make garbage. They go to work. They happen to work in the garbage dump. They go uh, pick up garbage cans. They take them back. They burn them. Um, it turns into air pollution. They get paid. They go back home. They buy junk so they can throw it in the trash the next day and burn it again. Um, and this was, I love this diagram because out of context of SimCity, it's just great, like, anti-capitalist propaganda. <laughs> uh, this is my approach of doing what I call a time and space diagram, uh, like the Napoleon's March diagram, where uh, for Spore, we have these different islands. Now, the shape of the island, the details of the island, isn't what I'm asking somebody to build. I'm not giving this to a level designer and say, build this for me. This is the plans. This is conceptual. It's abstract. It's showing you the principles of how to build islands uh, for Spore. And again, there's a lot of information. But basically, you start as a cell. You wander your way across the island. And eventually, you're going to make a tribe at the other side. And this kind of shows you different encounters that you may have along the way and different paths that you can take to get through it. Down here is that timeline again of showing us like up to 60 minutes of gameplay and what level your creature should be at any given time. Uh, this is a, a SimCity version of that same thing. Again, this is really a mess. When you first look at it, you don't understand how to interpret it. But I'll zoom up a little bit. This is kind of showing, we don't expect you to do everything, but we expect you to kind of like take one path through this. So I might build a town and decide, I'm going to build an um, auto HQ and build like uh, car factories. Or I'm going to build a casino and go up this way. So you, you won't experience all of this content. But the time over here is showing you about how much time it'll take to get to that phase of the game. And so then we can start mapping that out and again try to figure out how much content we need for that. Relationship diagrams are really important. This is where you take all your systems and you just try to put them on one piece of paper so that we can see how all the systems relate to each other across the game experience. Um, so this was for another unshipped game. It was this kind of robot fighting game where you travel to different planets and fight different robots. You could build them up yourself. Um, the, at the time I was working on this diagram, I was looking for the holy grail, which I told you in the beginning, don't do. But I want to do it just because I want to see if it can be done, which is this is one piece of paper that describes the entire game. You don't need any other piece of paper. This is it. And I kept trying to do that, knowing that I couldn't, but still wanting to try to see how far I could push it. 
Um, and again, notice the title up at the top, a big giant diagram in the middle, which is maybe taking up more space than it needs to given the information that's contained in it, but it looks cool. And so you hang it up on the wall and people walk by it and they're like, what is that thing? And then they get sucked into it. So it's an advertising trick. It's like it's a way, and you hang these up uh, on the way to the bathroom or you hang them up in the kitchen over top of the microwave where you know people are just gonna be hanging out for a while. And you just try to get them to read these documents with any trick you possibly can. Uh, this is the SimCity overview, and I won't go into details about all the little modules, but basically everything that's bold is a main feature of the game and something that is going to need other documents to support it. But this is the relationships showing how all the different systems all work together into one unified play experience. As we start to zoom down, I have to make another page just for, say, transportation, in this case the coal system, how coal comes from the ports into the trucks and gets delivered around the town. Um, and burned up to supply power. This is a relationship diagram from the robot game. And the reason I'm showing this one is because it, this was the first take on it, the first pass that I did. And we had these three different factions of robots and we wanted the game to be playable forever. So we're like, hey, let's be rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors is playable forever, right? It never, there, it's not, nothing ever wins constantly against everything else. So I came up with this rock, paper, scissors idea that every robot was in a corner and you would be basically building different factions um, in the corners, like one rock, one paper, one scissors, and they would fight each other. And we realized really quickly that that was going to be just as boring as rock, paper, scissors is after you've played it three or four times. Um, so looking at the diagram, though, it's like we just have to think about the diagram differently. It's basically the same information, but I'm presenting it slightly differently. So instead of saying the Futurians are rock and the aliens are paper, I'm saying the Futurians can go from rock to paper. You're building these robots out of a bunch of parts in this game. And depending on what parts you put on, you may make Eve from WALL-E or you may make this um, uh, Macross type robot. And so they all belong to this Futurians category. But it gives the player, instead of just saying, I'm throwing rock, paper, scissors, they're like, I'm throwing 30% you know, rock with 70% paper. And how is that going to stack up? And it actually gives you, since you're controlling those percentages and how you built your robot, it's giving you a lot of um, a different ways of playing the game. So, you know, I've said this a couple of times already, but that was a pretty complicated idea that I was able to explain pretty quickly because of these two charts, and you can see the difference between them all. Um, but I didn't know this when I started drawing this. I drew this first and thought I was done. And only after I drew it and it was all finished did it occur to me that there was other ways of kind of rotating it to make that happen. So there's a lot of gain you can get even as a designer as you're working through these drawings. Matrices, um, this is one of the last things um, I want to talk about. Draw a grid first and then do your design. Don't do all these little tiny pieces and then try to figure out how they fit into the whole. So it's really easy to just sit down and you're like with your buddies and you're like, hey man, we should put on like this uh, chainsaws and also I want like dinosaurs with lasers and I want this. And you're just like throwing in all this stuff and it's all cool and everybody agrees that you want chainsaw wielding dinosaurs with lasers, like nobody's going to turn that down. But if you don't understand the whole context of where it all fits, then you're just going to end up making a lot of content that you, a lot of wasted uh, time and effort is going to go into it. So in this, this is kind of a little toy example of, let's say I'm working on an RPG game, and I have these six character classes, and I have these four factions. I do that first, and then I go and I do the design work. It's like, well, what is a, a fire scout? What is a metal thief? Like, what are those things? And now we do the design and work it up. So again, this is just kind of a fake example. But as I started filling in this chart, I realized really quickly that it was a lot of work to fill in every single cell. So it's, as I looked at it more, it's like, you don't really want water and nature fighters. You want metal and fire fighters, right? Those are the, like the cool fighter archetypes. And so when you look at the chart, you can kind of quickly see like the fighter is fire and metal. No one else has fire and metal as a combo. Every one of these is unique. So mages have fire and water, but nobody else has fire and water. Um, so as we start to spread it out, we get kind of two benefits here. One is that there's half as much work to do. So that's just a great win for the team. The other is actually more flavorful for the player. They see a lot more differences between the different things, and that actually makes the game stronger overall. So a chart like this, a table like this, kind of showing it at a high level before you dig into the work um, can be super valuable that way. Here's a real world example from Spore. So I was a designer on the Cell game, and this is the matrix showing you kind of how you uh, encounter all the NPCs as you work your way through. 
Um, so I'm not going to get into all the details, but this is kind of taking that idea of matrices and just kind of blowing them up and showing every part in the cell game and how they relate to everybody else and how we can chain all of those together uh, to make kind of more complicated diagrams. They still can fit on one page, um, but they're, we know they're very thorough. We know they're kind of feature complete because all the boxes are filled up and have information. This is when it goes wrong. This is the end of Spore. We were trying to pull everything together. And I don't have time to go through all the detail of this, but basically I made this Excel spreadsheet, which is, I think, four-dimensional, maybe five-dimensional, and um, realized it's like nobody can understand what this is, even though it's, it's complete. All the information is there. Good luck trying to interpret it. Now, like years later, I don't even know what it means anymore. Um, so when I was working on this, it's like this is the bad way to, to think about this information. And so, again, I'm, I don't have time to go through all like, the, the tiny details of how Spore worked, but I'll just show you the diagrams and give you kind of a sense of the process. So I'm like, well, what if all the possibilities, instead of being an Excel spreadsheet, are through time, where you start here and you work your way to these outer edges, and those are the different things that you could do in the game. And then I realized it's like not really a circle, it's more of a half circle, where it's like you could be evil or fighters on one side, or you could be really nice on the other side. You would be neutral if you go up the middle. So this is kind of the second version of that diagram. Still was like too complicated, too much information, too many colors. Um, came up with this kind of algorithm of how you could solve it programmatically. If you just make this computer algorithm, you program this in, it'll give you the color uh, that you need. And kind of was done with it right here in terms of getting the job done. But it haunted me. Like I still felt I didn't actually come up with the diagram that described the whole space efficiently. So I was just doodling around and made every possible thing you can do in the game. So like in this case, I'm really, really evil killing everybody, and then I'm nice right at the very end. Or I'm really nice all the way through the game. Or I'm really nice and then I decide to be evil. So everything you can do in Spore throughout the entire game is all like drawn here. And I'm like, well, that was a waste of time. This makes no sense either. Um, but at least it's complete in that I know the scope of the thing. Um, but as I was goofing around and getting an Illustrator, it's really easy to drag stuff around. I realized that if I plot these all together, each one of these origins should all be at 0, 0, because this is where you start the game. So I just started dragging these, these vectors one at a time into the middle and lining all their origins to see what would happen. And as I did, like, this is what came out of that. This is the picture that came out. And I thought, like, OK, that's it. Like, that's the space described to me um, of how it worked. Now, again, I'm not asking you to like, understand what this means, but you just kind of look at it and it's like, yeah, that, that looks right. Like, the colors are all kind of like, set up in these little zones and the way they shade through. And this is exactly the same information as in that, in that Excel spreadsheet that I just showed you a few slides back. But a lot easier if you worked on the team and you understand all the details about how to read it and interpret what's going on. So this is another power of making these one-page designs is that it just kind of really engages you in the process of design as you work your way through it. All right, so let me kind of wrap up with just some uh, benefits here. Actually, let me talk about some of the problems. So it's hard to keep up, as you can imagine. A team of 100 people, SimCity took about four years. Um, I started out making diagrams like this in pre-production because I had a lot of time, so I could make little cool trucks and boats and all that stuff. Later on, as I started to run out of time, they're just top-down kind of flow charts. And later on, when I'm really running out of time, they are pencil, and I draw them on a piece of paper, and I hand them to the designer, and like, just do this. Like, just, you, you understand, I don't need to draw. Well, I'll draw a little train, if that makes you happy, or a little boat. Um, but we don't, I don't have time to put it in Illustrator and make it like all attractive. That's OK. Like, this process is great, actually. This is really what matters at the end, when you're like sprinting, and everybody understands the project. The stuff at the beginning matters when you're trying to get executives to fund your project and make sure that they believe that you think you know what you're doing. But if you, came, if you led with this, you would never get any money. All right, so hard to keep up, hard to organize. Um, this was a, some of the many uh, SimCity diagrams that I worked on, crime systems, school systems, airports, what's that, uh, casinos, um, uh, launching space shuttles. This is what my desk looked like at the end of the project. And people would come up to me and they would say, like, hey, can I have the design diagram for whatever? And I'm like, um, it's somewhere here. I mean, let me just print you one. It's easier for me to print it than it is for me to find it on my desk. And of course, this is a problem. So I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? Like, I, everybody loves these one-page designs, but I'm, I've now just created my own design Bible. It's just got a lot of cool pictures in it. Um, and, but it's just now, it's like, it's got all the problems that I talked about in the beginning about searching and, and trying to find information that you wanted. So we started this approach where each designer would 
uh, would just get their own section that they needed and hang it on the wall nearby them. And so they were kind of making their own one-page designs that were important to them on their walls. So these are like some of the different designers and how they kind of arranged their, their information up on the walls. Eventually, we just took over a whole hallway and I just put every design document down the hallway and the joke in the team was like, you've gone from one page design to one wall design. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you know, that's what it takes to get all the information out. Uh, towards the end of the project, we actually took over an entire room and you would walk through the door and it was all kind of like an art gallery. You would walk around the room and it was all there. And it worked like, so think about this for a second. I'm, you know, you're invited to, you know, you're hired to work on the SimCity team. It's day one. And there's two options. One would be, Go sit at your desk and read the wiki and read everything that's been written about this project to date. And when you're all done reading it all, come to, come, if you have any questions, talk to me and I'll go over it with you. Compared to, oh, welcome to the team. Come into this room. Okay, here's some pictures. Let me talk about this. Let me explain this. Let me explain that. It takes about an hour. You go through the entire room. They're all done. They've seen the entire scope. They know where to come back. They know where to find it. And it's very interactive that they can ask me questions along the way as we go through. It also worked great for marketing people. It worked great for just like random executives that would come in. It's like, what's, how's your project going? Come into the, the one room design and uh, we'll go through it all with you and we'll show you like what's changed and where we're all at. So it was like super beneficial. It like helped the project so much, especially with a game like SimCity, which has so many moving pieces uh, that you're trying to manage um, to have it all in one spot in a way that was digestible that way. All right, so one size doesn't fit all, obviously. I'm talking about these giant posters and rooms and walls. Sometimes the design might just be a little card. And I made these, they're about the size of a playing card for the animators um, to understand how times worked in SimCity because players can fast forward and there's day-night cycles and things like that. So I just stuck them on their monitor and all the, all the uh, animators were like, oh, thanks for this. Like, this helps a lot. Very simple playing card size. Uh, doesn't replace writing. So one takeaway that is wrong from this talk is don't write, only draw pictures. Uh, it's actually completely wrong. Um, you should still write. Unfortunately for a lot of people, it's like, I don't wanna do this. Like, I'd rather just like look pictures. Now, I just spent the whole like hour saying, don't do this, and now I'm telling you, you know, like you don't, no one will read this. This isn't for people to read. This is for you as a designer. This is the same thing I talked about in the beginning. The value of writing every sentence down, the value of making all these paragraphs is huge. You, you will understand your project if you have to write it down in a way that you can't any other way. So you still need to write stuff. And there are people on the team who need to like read this very formal documentation, especially like QA people. Um, the difference is, is that you should never, at least I don't, ever expect anybody to read it. It's for me, it's a way of me getting my information to myself clear. And then once I understand this, making the pictures is a lot easier. Making the one page diagrams and distilling the essence of this uh, becomes a lot simpler. All right, so those are problems, but it's easy to share designs across the team. You want people to look at the designs. If they're just in a file somewhere, you know, PowerPoint, maybe nobody clicks on it. It's just kind of lost in a hard drive, a, a Google Doc, something. Um, it syncs up imaginations in the way that I've talked about throughout this talk. Like, I know you're, seeing, you're imagining the things I want you to imagine because they're up here on the screen. They're not meant to be framed. They're meant to be scribbled on. So when you bring them into a meeting, bring pencils, because a lot of people don't bring pencils with them anymore. Um, bring pencils, encourage participation. And say, like, draw on this, make it a mess. So I might make something like this, and the um, level designer gives it back to me, and it looks like this. And that's great. Like, that's what you want. Because that, mean, that way you know that they're engaged with it, they're studying it, and they're going to make changes. And if you need to, then you make the revisions and, and print out a new one. Personal benefits. I've talked about this a lot. This is. You have to understand what you're doing to make one of these. You can't fake it. You can't make a one-page design and not really know what you're talking about. You've, you've got to like, understand it as a designer in order to do it. Um, it forces you to be concise. Like You put the title up on your page. You have a certain amount of real estate to work with. You need to really know what's going to go on that page. You need to really think about it. And if it starts to sprawl, if your design gets to be too big and it doesn't fit, you have to start asking yourself questions. It's like, am I just sprawling? Am I just going out of scope? Why do I need all this extra stuff? If I have to cut it to make it fit, what's the most important parts? That's what I need to focus on. Uh, the relationships in the system, I talked about this a lot already. Definitely aids in problem solving, just by the act of making it, forces you to solve problems. Um, and overall, kind of to wrap it up here, the goal of design is really a goal of communication, especially with a big team. You want as many people possible to all be focused in the same direction. 
and good designers make sure that everybody understands the vision and they're all working in the way they need to uh, be working. This is a question I get asked a lot. It's like, man, that looks like a lot of work. Why would I want to do work at my job? Um, it's like, because it's your job. Like, if it was fun, you would be paying someone else to do it. Um, but people are paying you to do this. So, you know, if you're, the other way of thinking about it is like, if you're not communicating effectively, then you're not really doing your job. And so anything that it takes to make sure information is spread out and distributed and understood across the team is worth the effort that you're going to put into it. And ultimately, people will read your stuff instead of just clicking on the link and looking at the scroll bar and then filing it away. All right, so that's it. So this is, uh, this is Brian, my assistant designer on SimCity, pretending to care about all this stuff. And um, that's it. So thank you very much. I know I'm a little bit over time, but.